I'm uh, I'm on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise at the moment, and uh, that's with a Halloween theme, so I thought it'd be a bit of fun to start with that. But I'm actually going to turn my video off now and just go over to the presentation, um, just to save a bit of bandwidth, which is one thing you can do if you're ever having trouble uh, with the uh, connections with e-learning. So back in a second. Okay, hopefully you can see my slide now. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, best practices for online and distance learning. And um, these uh, are sort of things I want to cover today really about um, curriculum and e-learning, do a little bit of talk about how those two interrelate, platforms and media, social media and assessment, if we get time to get to that. Um, I quite liked this uh, Dr. Zeus um, T-shirt I saw the other day that was uh, being uh, put around and uh, I will teach you in a room, I will teach you now on Zoom, I will teach you in your house, I will teach you with a mouse, I will teach you here and there, I will teach because I care. And that probably sums up sort of the, the, some of the sort of angst that everybody is having at the moment because they've been thrown into e-learning in the deep end in many cases um, with the current pandemic. And I hope you're all keeping well. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues that that's caused as well uh, as, as we sort of talk about e-learning and um, some best practices. Because e-learning has been around for a long time, but actually we've all, all been thrown into it much more than we probably anticipated we would um, because of the current pandemic. So if we sort of, what we're going to talk about today and looking at e-learning, um, I'm going to give a plug for this book, which has just come out now um, from Cosin, and uh, The Role of the Nurse Educator in Canada by Karen Page uh, Kutrara and Patricia Bradley. And it's an excellent resource for any new nurse educator and includes um, many of the sort of issues we're going to talk about in e-learning in there. So um, if you're a new or novice nurse educator, I'd highly recommend a copy as essential reading. But also there's a lot in there that's of value to any um, other uh, sort of experienced educator. So uh, I'd highly recommend it. Um, apart from that, um, I'm going to be using a couple of polls today. So if you've got a browser open on your computer, um, go to pollev.com backslash Bernie G and you'll be able to access the polls I'm going to use today. I'm just going to put a couple in there for fun. And uh, this is an example of how you can use polling as well in short presentations. Most platforms now have polling built in, but um, you don't necessarily have to use the one that's uh, built into your platform. You can use others like Polev or Poll Everywhere or, or others. So having said that, I'm going to just put up the first uh, poll now. If you go to that site, you can see um, Basically, you can go to polev.com, enter Birdie G and respond to the activity. And the question I'm asking you is, what could you do now uh, with technology that you couldn't do 10 years ago? You can also put it in the question and answers um, box as well. So um, let's see what people come up with. And um, I think there's quite a lot we can actually uh, See, I've got Zoom meetings and scanning, sharing documents easily with smartphone, smartphones, stream high quality video. Yeah, so there's a, a huge amount we can do, particularly in, in 10 years. I'll just put that up on the screen so you can see um, that a bit um, better. Right, let's see if we can put that up just to show you. Um, yeah, so if we look at sort of the results that people are, are are showing now, um, we can see that, uh, you know, word clouds, video conference every year, feeling more comfortable, pivoting, um, uh, all sorts of things really that we, we couldn't do at all in the last um, sort of 10 years ago. And particularly, I think high stream quality streaming and media is, is one of the key um, things that, that have come around. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and um, I think one of the things that's important to think about in any type of e-learning is that uh, you need to actually think about your curriculum and design and does it support e-learning? Um, really, there, there's, there's a lot of issues we do have with the curriculums uh, and design for e-learning that we're, we're simply adapting curriculum that were adapted for other purposes, for in-classroom, which is the traditional way, um, uh, of course, of delivery. And 
putting that online and that doesn't tend to work so well. Um, so if we want, you know, our curriculum to be effective for e-learning, really it needs to uh, be one that supports collaborative, social, humanist, constructivist and para pragmatic approaches um, with reduced didactic instructional elements. And we do see that a lot with, with e-learning novices or people who aren't familiar. They tend to use a lot of didactic instruction, simply using Zoom or other synchronous conferencing um, to replace the classroom. That doesn't always work well. Um, so we do need to think about the curriculum quite carefully and how it supports e-learning. Um, particularly looking at teachers as providers and guides of answers to expert questions rather than as instructors delivering content. Um, and again, this, this, this is more of from an individual uh, move from an individual teacher focus to being a member of a team, which does involve us relinquishing some control to students, something we're all often very reluctant to do, and, and mainly because we're, we're, we're very much, uh, in, as particularly as nurse educators, uh, in the sort of stage of being, retaining control of students is very important for safety and practice. And uh, we tend to find that spills over into educational approaches as well, where um, we're often not as sort of happy to relinquish control to the students as we probably should be. Um, and so again, it's from this move from being a provider of content to designer of learning experiences. So it's important that our curriculum do actually support e-learning and uh, aren't just a, a direct transfer of what we used to do in the classroom into the um, e-learning environment. And this is a table from the book that just illustrates some of those approaches I was just talking about, um, particularly the humanist constructivist and pragmatic approaches are the way really that we can make e-learning most effective if we design our curriculum around there. People are often surprised when you say, well, humanism, how does that work with e-learning? Because surely humanism, generally humanistic approaches involve people and people interacting together in social circumstances. But really humanism is more about actually uh, looking at growth of the individual and um, supporting the student growth. And uh, you can do that in e-learning as very effective as just as well as you can do in the classroom. So way back in the year 2000, when e-learning was kicking off, a colleague of mine called Richard Francis um, at Oxford Brookes University started to look at e-learning um, because we were have implementing a complete learning management system there and um, looking at overall at what was being implemented at, with uh, places like the Open University and other UK universities um, to see what we could implement at our university. And it led to us uh, writing a couple of chapters in this book, which I'd still recommend it's around. It's a bit dated, but the principles still actually apply. And one of the issues that we, we talked about quite considerably in the book and wrote a chapter on was this idea of orientation and disorientation. Um, and really, when we looked at a lot of the early systems, and I hate to say some of this still applies today, um, we found that a lot of them actually had confusing menus, submenus, non-intuitive interfaces. I mean, really, we know three clicks should be able to get you anywhere on a website or interface, uh, and that is very rarely the case with modern e-learning systems or even some websites. Um, also, we found excessive sources for the same information, so posted in different parts, duplication, and a lack of uh, contextual support, and even some very uh, garish interfaces. And one of the primary things we also found was excessive text-based screen content. And unfortunately, as I say, most of that still exists in um, a, a lot of e-learning systems I see today, which is quite surprising sort of 20 years later. So what, what are we trying to do with our students online? Well, we're trying to actually engage them um, just as we do in the classroom. And this diagram of a HEB uh, engagement curve uh, illustrates the principle quite well. Um, Donald HEB was a, a, a 1949 neuro um, scientist who actually um, looked at um, particularly uh, learning theory and, and how people learn. But th this idea that um, what we want the experience to be, the learning experience in e-learning, is um, in this middle area of what's called the HEB curve, where it's not too boring and it's not too uh, exciting uh, and it's not too relaxing and it's not anxiety provoking. So you want your content to be in the middle there. Unfortunately, a lot of people either tend to go to one extreme or the other when they adopt e-learning. Um, if, if the 
the content is obviously very dry and boring and delivered in a very didactic fashion. Um, it's, it's, it becomes very unpleasant for the student um, and our arousal levels are going to be low. But if it's too exciting the other way and you've got too much going on with videos, um, flash presentations, all sorts of stuff, uh, it, it's very distracting. And again, student learning is reduced. Um, and the same way with relaxation and anxiety. You do want to, a little bit of anxiety in there because you want to push the students over their boundaries um, and you don't want it too relaxing. So sometimes um, making it, you know, safe environment for our students can actually make it um, sort of particularly um, too safe that they're not being pushed away from their boundaries, which is, of course is what we want to do. Um, and um, yeah, there's some questions popping up, but I'll address those. Uh, thanks, Anita, at, at the end, um, once we get to that section. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's out there. So what online management platform are you actually um, using now? Um, let's have a I think what people are actually using. Um, if you can just type in using the poll or you can type them in again in the question answer or the chat. Um, I'll bring up the chat so I can see that too. Um, we can see, so Moodle, uh, Webex, D2L, Canvas, some people are using, um, a lot of people using Zoom, Brightspace. We use Canvas here. We did use Blackboard for a while. I won't put up the answers here. I'll just carry on because of time, but we're, there's a whole wide variety. Yeah, Blackboard Collaborate and Zoom seems to be the top ones. Um, you can vote them up as well. And I see actually Moodle's come up quite a lot. And I think Moodle is very popular, um, mainly because it's, it's a, a cost effective solution for a lot of people um, in e-learning. E um, and so where do we go wrong with these environments? Um, what are some of the common issues? Let's have a think about it because, because they do crop up again and again, the, the dreadful uh, error messages that we get uh, and computers don't always come up for these. Um, very common is overly complex online course designs and navigation with the multiple areas duplicating function. Uh, the other one is putting masses of PDFs online. I've seen that a lot where people tend to move all their content into PDFs because it's actually very easy now, portable document files, and then just posting that online for students, which means they have a huge mass of reading material they have to get through. Lack of structured development of content. Um, one of the biggest issues that I see there with um, educators and particularly junior faculty is inheriting courses. Um, I'm sure some of you have inherited those um, where you, you're given a course that's been actually produced by someone else. You didn't develop it and you're now in the situation of delivering it. And what usually happens is the, these aren't courses that have just been de developed by one person. They've, they've actually been developed and revamped over, you know, perhaps five years by different people. So you end up with a course that has been, everybody puts their own slant on it and the, you're, you're having to do the same and you're having to deliver something that actually doesn't have a very well structured development of the content it, it, it's a bit of a mishmash because everybody's had at it um i'd be interested to see if, if people have had that experience uh, in their own um, d development of courses and use of courses overuse of didactic content online for example simply sort of lots of lectures posting lectures um video lectures even um or, or presentations with voiceovers um, which is very really much a one-way transmissive use of the technology. Um, and also lots of long talking head monologues. And of course, masses of, of web uh, text, uh, which is actually something that we very commonly do, um, which we because we are a very content heavy discipline. We have a huge amount of content to deliver in nursing programs, particularly in undergraduate programs, where we have a short period of time to uh, get through a mass of, of curriculum content. Um, but you've got to remember a printed page resolution is normally around 600 to 2,400 dots per inch where screens are generally well under 300 and most are actually under 200 dots per inch. Um, so, you know, reading online is actually quite stressful for the eyes as well um, as uh, giving you a headache for a length of time. So, um, and students, if they're going to print stuff out, are going to have to pay to do that. So, so a lot of text online tends to encourage people to read it online. And that even with the new high resolution screens, um, that can be a problem. 
um, using asynchronous time to lecture. Sorry, that should be synchronous time to lecture. So if you're using uh, synchronous connections such as Zoom, things like that, delivering lectures through it isn't probably the best use of that technology. It's much better used for discussion as, as we sort of talked about a little bit earlier um, because it's the, the only chance students really get to interact. Um, and links to external resources that no longer work, dead URLs. Anybody who does e-learning, this is a nightmare for you. Each time before you start the course, you basically have to go through and check all your hypertext links, your URLs work, and um, inevitably they change and get shut down. People remove content for particularly external sources. Um, I've had this happen to me where I've checked it the day before the course went live, and you go in a week later and the students are complaining this link doesn't work. It's very, very tricky to do that, but um, sometimes the e-learning departments will support you by checking your links for you before the course goes live. The other thing that uh, we can do with e-learning is really reflect what we're actually trying to do in the classroom. And if, if you think about it, our transferable educational goals for e-learning are exactly the same as what we're trying to achieve uh, in our classes, making connections through cases, case studies, examples, um, going through case histories and, and stories of um, people's experiences in healthcare, a very, very useful way that we can use e-learning for that. Um, also considering different perspectives. Um, it's really quite now easily possible to do this with e-learning as just as much as it is in the classroom um, and uh, bring in different perspectives, particularly with e-learning, you can bring in external perspectives. And I don't think we do that enough. We often tend to work within our own comfort zone and sometimes bringing in alternative perspectives from outside can help push students um, to consider different ways of doing things. Uh, fostering greater depth of discussion, engaging students as teachers. Again, you can do this online. People are very reluctant to do it because of the use of technology, but actually I've done it over the last few years very successfully, getting students to actually present online. And in many cases, they're much better at doing it than I am. Um, they've grown up with these technologies and they are very competent at being able to deliver online. And so they, what they don't have often is the skills as teachers, uh, but you can help facilitate that. And of course, part of professional development is being able to disseminate and teach. So uh, getting students to do that in class is, is something you can do electronically as well. Of course, we want to engage critical thinking and uh, interactivity. And one last one I got here is particularly relevant that you can do with e-learning that is very difficult to do in the classroom is globalize the curriculum. Um, there's a reference for you at the end of a project we went and, and did, a colleague of mine, Dr. Roger Cutting in the UK, where we actually um, got students from three different countries talking, from the UK, Canada, and Zambia, um, to compare experiences with a particular aspect of healthcare. And um, so we, we got them online posting asynchronously, posting messages in discussion boards um, and um, using, uh, the social media that was available freely to um, share ideas. So the way we worked this was, for example, we posed a question for them and get them to discuss it for a week and then post a joint response online. And uh, it, it was a way, it was a good way to globalize the cur curriculum because of course, students in um, economically developed countries like UK and Canada have no real idea what the actual you know, healthcare situations are like for those people living in Zambia who have a very different experience. And so it's quite a powerful tool to globalize the curriculum. Uh, and you can do this in a number of ways in e-learning. So of course the dreaded synchronous versus asynchronous delivery uh, question. And if we, we think about these, there are, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to both and they do overlap as well. People often get confused about um, wh where the, the boundaries are. But of course, in asynchronous, you can complete your work uh, to a schedule, receive immediate feedback, and, and you can do the work whenever you want it to, because um, basically you don't have to be there at the same time, just log in and respond um, to messages, discussions, post material, et cetera, uh, answer questions. Whereas of course, synchronous, when we're actually together, 
um, we really have a different set of tools available to us then and uh, enable us to have live discussions that we we didn't actually we weren't actually able to do in the past so easily uh, I mean one of the interesting things since the pandemic is the rise of zoom zoom was a fairly unheard of tool it wasn't that well used uh, prior to this year and um, if you had shares in zoom I should think you'd do pretty well this year because everybody's now using it because it's a very simple and easy to use uh, vid synchronous um, video conferencing platform that labels group interactions as we are doing right now um, but there is this overlap in the in between and um, so it's important to think of these two as really more uh, spheres learning tools that do overlap and so thinking which one you're going to use for your content is quite important if we look at the asynchronous potential where people aren't together, where we can link to alternative resources. As I've said, globally, you can use global resources and uh, again, things like YouTube videos, other media that you can use to bring in to make your curriculum more lively um, is good. You can mobilize it, people can access it, you know, while they're on the move on their uh, smartphone devices or tablets. And um, we can do things like case-based reasoning where we look at uh, examples of uh, cases, case history studies, and then deconstruct them to, you know, look at the rationale for decision making and uh, involve students in those sorts of activities online. And of course, provide peer and email support to our students. They can support each other, which is a very uh, important factor of uh, e-learning, building in mechanisms so students can support each other. And, and of course, email support. And also things that you can do with asynchronous uh, tools are simply post content such as exam, mock exam papers, things like that, or quizzes that get people ready for exams. But there are some issues with it that we commonly see. So the pitfalls are often multi lengthy discussion threads. I'm sure some of you um, may have come across, you know, those in e learning experiences where you have masses of discussions going on simultaneously, and they're all hugely long and you're asking students or you're being asked to participate in those. Um, and it takes an awful lot of time to go through and read them all, especially if not got good tools to um, edit threads or, or condense them. Um, overly large discussion groups, again, discussion groups, when they get over about 10 people, they start to become very cumbersome to use. Um, so breaking discussion groups up into small, even if they're doing the same topic into small, smaller groups works much better. Um, you can then compare the results within those groups and discuss that um, in, in the whole. Um, too many concurrent discussions, again, having multiple discussions on at the same time, really you only want two or three at any one given time, otherwise it, it becomes a huge amount for the students to try and focus on, um, read and keep up to date with all the posts. And overly complex instructions for activities, again students, this, as I was talking about disorientation earlier, if students um, find that they're, you know, getting hugely complex instructions of how to to engage in an activity, it does end up switching a lot of people off and you lose people on the way or people don't understand exactly what they should be doing. Uh, and of course, reading overload. The one thing we tend to do is, as I've said, put lots of text-based materials up and that, that does cause a lot of reading. I, I don't expect there's anyone here who's a teacher who, who doesn't have students complaining at, you know, in the course feedback, <laughs> there was too much reading in this course. Um, it happens to us all. Okay, what about synchronous then? Well, if we look at synchronous, we can get people together, create group cohesion, which is so important at the moment in this pandemic when it's really difficult to be together uh, and enabling a group to come together and uh, work together is, is so important and enables you to create that um, just as you would in a live class. You can also bring experts in to teach any time. Guest lecturers I've actually found are easier to get to do Zoom sessions than they are to get into class sometimes um, because they just have to log in and they can deliver. And you can get some, obviously we all have access to some really good expert um, clinicians and uh, researchers out there. Uh, and as educators, we can bring in um, to consider. Uh, again, you can do exam preparation live with that just as you can in, in um, asynchronous and so you know there are some overlap of activities you can do small group work uh, often people are a bit reluctant to use breakout rooms in synchronous activities but actually they're really good you can get group small group work going just like you can in the classroom and uh, get 
students to engage in smaller groups and then come back to the main. Um, Zoom supports that and other platforms do as well. Live quizzes and games, role play, everybody <laughs> sort of tends to throw their hands up at the idea of role play online. Um, students often find difficulties with it in the classroom, but you can do it. Um, you can do basically most stuff you can do in a classroom, you can actually do online in a, a group um, setting as well. Live quizzes are quite good. So what are the issues that we often see with synchronous um, learning? Well, microphone and audio management are huge. Um, you know, people leaving their mics open. So being uh, comfortable with what the tools are to actually control mics is pretty important. Um, audio management is often much more of a problem than um, video management. So we see, you know, people inadvertently having discussions with their kids or um, other members of the family while they're online, things like that, noises, uh, feedback, all those issues. So getting comfortable with that is, is pretty important and being able to control that. Multitasking, and that's an interesting, I mean, how many of you listening to this now are actually have your word or email open and are multitasking? I suspect quite a few. Um, it is an issue because it distracts you from what's actually going on. And if students are doing this, then again, they're not gonna be uh, using the, the tool as effectively as they could be. It's a very strong, um, actual pull to do something else while you're watching a presentation or in a live class because obviously um, you people can't see exactly what you're doing so you can have your email open right next to you but it's actually something we should probably try and avoid um, lack of interaction and use of different different media again using talking heads where you you give a lecture via synchronous classes really a waste of time of the, of the technology um, it's much better used, especially in these times where we have limited group contact to actually engage in discussion and seminar type activities. Drop connection. Um, and again, that's a problem. I've had that with, with pres presentations I've given recently with Zoom. And so one way you can help get around that is have a backup ready. I actually got a laptop here ready to go in case this computer conks out and I could just log on and continue with that. Uh, you could do that even with a smartphone or something so that you can come back to students if you do get drop connections. But one of the prime things I see is pre presenters being unfamiliar with e-tools. Uh, and that can be quite an issue. So it, it's, it's interesting because people often assume that, well, I shouldn't need to be familiar with all this technology, really. That's the role of, you know, the educational technologists to support me. But it's the same as, you know, being familiar with the tools you use in practice. Um, you have to learn how to use the clinical equipment. And so we get expert at that as nurses. And nurses are technologically incredibly competent. Um, compared to lots of professionals I've worked with. Um, and so, you know, being familiar with electronic tools, taking the time to invest to learn how they work and what you can do with them uh, is, is pretty important. Um, and things you can do with synchronous learning to, to improve the experience. Uh, logging early, students uh, ask them to come, you know, log in before the session starts, do tech checks of microphones, do a sound check at the start. Um, see if the students brought the needed items to the session as everybody got everything that you're going to be discussing today and done the prep. Um, explain the goals, make it visual with um, colour, sound and animation. And, and then in your own room as well, you can put up a do not disturb sign and make sure you've got water there. And like I said, have a backup system. All those things can help um, make you a successful synchronous presenter. Okay, so Moving on, I'm not going to ask. I was going to do a quick quiz on what your uh, what your favourite synchronous presentation tool is, but you can put that in the chat. Um, most people are using um, Zoom now. People, some are using Teams and a few other Microsoft Teams and a few other platforms. But it, it, from what I can gather, Zoom is uh, seems to have become the predominant one. So how do you promote positive reactions, uh, interactions on, on these synchronous tools like Zoom? Well, setting ground lines, uh, ground rules at the start is pretty essential. Um, and what is acceptable and unacceptable behaviours and what your expectations are? Um, so these are the same as in class, really. Punctuality, you can even do this as a group activity in your very first classes. Um, clearly setting guidelines for online behaviours um, to make sure that but, you know, people uh, interact respectfully and don't disrupt the class with other things that might be going on. Um, pulse checks. See, 
if you want to do that at the start of the class, it's very useful to understand where students are, if they're very anxious about what's happening, whether it's the content or something else that's going on at this particular time, um, and provides an open forum for them to engage and create some of this group cohesion we keep talking about. And check on comfort and comprehension. And competitions, gamify content to test knowledge and create an enjoyable experience. Um, you can do quizzes, team activities, things like that. They all help. Um, and so to that end, here's, here's a fun little uh, uh, post for you, um, which I'm going to ask you to think. Um, you can actually enter this in the chat box. I'm going to show you a picture in a second. And uh, what I want you to do is um, show me what you think this is. Um, some of you may recognize it, others may not. That's uh, It'll show, show the older one, uh, experienced <laughs> teachers amongst us. Um, so let's have a look. Okay, so what do you think that is? Anybody want to type in the, the chat box what they think that is? And guess, you can have some guesses if you're not. Uh, and you can also see the second picture there, but I think everybody probably knows what the second picture is, but, pe but do people actually know what the first one is? Um, cardiac monitors, <laughs> some uh, folks are saying, uh, nope, it's not, um, but that's a very good guess. A projector of some time, getting closer. Obviously the overhead projector is the one on the right, yeah. I'm sure we've all seen those hanging around in dusty corners of classrooms now because they're not used so much now. Um, sometimes they're still used in practice and they still can be a uh, a useful tool. Uh, got music player, speak, amp, overhead, overhead projector, not sure, portable VCR. No, nobody's got this one. So it's showing my age because basically this is a tape slide presenter um, and it's technology from circa 1980s. Uh, and when I did my teacher training, which I did a one year teacher training course back in the 80s, um, we were told this was the technology of the future. And what you did is you put a cassette of actual slides, photographic slides in the top, and you put a cassette tape in the side and they were synced. And then you press the button, which you can see in front, you had this button you pressed and uh, every time uh, the tape got to a, a new, need a new slide, it would bleep and you press the button and it went on. Yes, this was in the UK, but they were widely available in the US as well. Uh, and they were basically seen to be the state of the art. So technology changes completely. Um, uh, yeah, how cumbersome it was. You had to wear headphones and you went and sat in this big thing you put on your desk and, and play it before the advent of uh, personal computers. Computers. So things have changed hugely and of course they're going to change hugely in the future as well. I'm sorry I don't have a prize for you here. Yeah, nobody actually got it so uh, <laughs> I can't give you a prize for that. I could give you a prize for the, the, uh, the who the first one to guess who is an OHP but that, that's pretty easy really. Uh, maybe Cousin can supply a prize pen or something for, for uh, the first to respond. Okay, so technology does move on, but putting quizzes and things like that in can actually make an activity more fun and break up the monotony of uh, having to do a presentation and, uh, and breaking up a Zoom session into segments with things like quizzes or competitions and things like that can actually be a very productive way to emotively engage your students because then they'll actually more likely to remember the content if they remember it uh, because it's emotionally associated with having a fun experience or a positive experience. Um, again, Zoom fatigue is something huge at the moment that we're all suffering for. So don't have your camera on all the time. Um, once you're actually uh, talking, there's not really a lot of you know point. If you if you want to engage in discussions, then I think it's useful. But when you're actually presenting, it's it's not necessary to do that. Um, do a class check-in for the first few minutes is is a very useful thing to do. I always do that. Uh, and avoid multitasking. Again, we said that. It, it, there's a strong tendency to do that, uh, but uh, I think, you know, it, any way you can break away from that and keep that to a minimum is a lot more likely to be more productive. And building breaks during classes. You don't have to, you know, do three hours of Zoom classes. That's really going you know, to kill your students. Um, so make sure you've got times when they're not actually doing something there. They're going away and reading something or thinking about a question and then coming back. Or you've got bathroom breaks in there, just like you do you have a, an actual live class and reduce on-screen stimuli. Don't make things too busy. Uh, put yourself out of view. Use static or simple backgrounds. Um, I'm a bit of a joke today, me using a Star Trek one, but 
yeah, normally I'd use a static one, not those animated ones that you can get for Zoom. They look fun, but they're actually um, quite wearing if a lot of people are using those animated backgrounds. So use simple ones. Um, you can still put up fun backgrounds that are, are static. Um, and again, using speaker view instead of the gallery view in Zoom is something I do a lot. And it's quite useful to avoid looking at the whole class all the time. Um, it's a very different experience when you're in a class and you can glance around and see what people are reacting to what you're doing. Um, you, you can't really do that so effectively currently with the current tools. And to be honest, trying to scan everybody that's uh, on video is, is it's very wearing and um, unproductive. So I'd recommend, you know, it's, it's not really a useful thing to do. So just put the speaker view up and whoever's speaking comes up. And then it's important after class to do a stretch, grab some water, go for a quick walk or decompress. Otherwise, we just end up sitting in a class um, with, you know, recurrent Zoom classes again and again. I don't know if you, what your experience is, but I, everybody I know is starting to get a bit of Zoom fatigue. OK, let, let's talk a little bit uh, to finish up about um, social media and privacy. Zoom hackers have now become a thing. And as we're aware, um, people, uninvited people turning up in Zoom conferences is quite common now. And there's lots of examples of it on the web. Um, you can use passwords, waiting rooms to screen people. Very positive thing to do before any um, sort of class that you're doing to make sure everybody there is actually who's supposed to be. Also, it's difficult because if some people phone in, you just get a phone number. So you don't know who's actually there coming into the class. But it's important to establish who those phone numbers belong to. Um, for example, we had a faculty meeting recently where somebody had popped into it and nobody knew who the phone number was. So we actually had to remove them in the end uh, because uh, we they didn't respond when we asked them to identify themselves and we had no idea who the person was. So everybody, you should know who everybody in your classroom is. Um, and certainly uh, if you don't, uh, then you have the right to remove people. Um, if possible, get a teaching assistant to screen people before they come in. That's a useful role for TAs. They can really help with um, online Zoom activities. Uh, don't forget to check for new updates when using web conferencing tools, because the worst thing you possibly have is you turn it on and it says, I'm doing an update on this. Um, and then you've got a five minute wait while your system updates. Um, so checking you everything works before you have to conference is important, whether it's Windows, Macs or whatever. Limit link sharing as well. Don't publicly post links, just send them to the people who need them. Um, and configure screen sharing permissions as well. Because um, you can, for example, turn off screen sharing and also turn off annotation because you can annotate screens in Zoom. Um, and I've seen people have uh, presentations and all of a sudden someone you know, draws a smiley face in the middle of it or something like that. It's a bit irritating and you can't tell who's done it either uh, on a lot of these uh, synchronous systems. So configure the security settings to make sure they match what you want to happen. But social media can be positive as well. So let's think about using it. You know, things like Facebook, Twitter, stuff like that. Um, you can create specific social media hubs for your courses, which can be more positive rather than just interacting in personal ones. Um, you can also use uh, strong social media guidelines. And these should really be, as I say, provided with other guidelines at the start of your course. So you want to make sure if, if you're using social media or people are engaging in social media as part of a course, um, you want very strong guidelines on what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable uh, in that. Um, but you can also stay on top of trends with social listening, you know, things like Twitter and um, other social media can actually help you um, see what current trends are and you can bring that into the class to help discuss um, current issues, particularly with things like pandemic related health issues. Um, also staying positive, very important to stay positive. It's a classic don't read the comments <laughs> uh, idea of social media, which are always all automatically negative. Uh, but staying positive, promote values and achievements you want students uh, to see in social media is very important, um, rather than being uh, critical or, 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 in, or sort of allowing a negative behaviours to develop in social media. Um, Engage students on and off campus. You can do that with social media in a way that uh, it's difficult to do in, um, in other aspects of e-learning. So even under normal non-pandemic, not all students live on campus. 
um, that doesn't mean they're less motivated and likely to engage in student life. So you can, we can use student media in higher education to allow students to connect and possibly creating safe spaces for them to create, create connect without um, faculty involvement. So they can have their own spaces where we say, we're not gonna go in there, that's your space, a student space. So lastly, the last thing I was going to talk about quickly to finish up is assessment. How do we assess uh, e-learning? I mean, it's all, it always, always a tricky thing to do. Um, but remember, the before, during and after assessments still apply in e-learning and distance learning just as much as they do in the classroom. You've got your formative and summative uh, assessment and, of course, your diagnostic uh, assessment tools. So it's important to choose the right tool, tool to assess the right set of skills. Uh, you can use the usual things, MCQs and written exams. Uh, MCQs are very easy to set up online when most learning platforms have tools to enable you to do that. And of course you can save them. Um, and you can do things like uh, um, randomize the questions so that they come up in different formats for students, which is not easy to do in paper versions. Um, essays, projects, usual sort of make a variety of assessment tools just as you do in your online classes. Uh, sorry, in your uh, classroom based activities, portfolios, all these things uh, can be useful to test different skills. But it really, the, the whole purpose of assessment planning is to figure which is the best tool to assess the student with the, what I want to know whether they can do. Um, the other thing to remember is it's either open or closed, not both. So if you're going to have open exams, they're great. Um, you can use those and you can plan exams which are open. So you allow students to um, do other things such as access other content, textbooks, websites, whatever they want um, while they're doing the exam. Or you can have closed exams which are more technically more challenging to set up, but you can't have both. You've got to go for one or the other and you've got to decide which one you're going to do and set that up appropriately. And lastly, I'd say Benjamin Bloom is your friend. People laugh at Benjamin Bloom being sort of an ancient, uh, objective structured, um, more behaviorist th type of approach to learning. But those, those different levels and um, different ways of contextualizing outcomes and um, co uh, learning objectives are actually very useful when you're constructing questions. So uh, they're still as valid today as when, when you came up with them. Of course, lastly, the last thing I was gonna talk about briefly is academic dishonesty and attendance. Um, we all have this pressure in nursing to have 100% attendance. Well, we certainly do here and most schools I'm aware of do because of professional requirements uh, in programs, which is very different from other programs in universities and higher education where it isn't required. Um, so it, it does get quite tricky to, to achieve that in e-learning sometimes. Uh, and also academic dishonesty is something that can um, occur in e-learning because it's easier to do it uh, when you're not actually in a class and, and to do it online um, with all the resources that are available to students these days. Um, so things you can do to try, if you have to have uh, attendance and you're, you're keeping attendance, start a quill or a, pause, a poll at random times, saving it to a time for 30 seconds and asking a question only students in class would know. Things like that can help attendance. Strategies uh, where you use multiple choice questions with a marked, marked response generally work best when they're asked uh, in class and only the students who are in class would get that question. Hide activity titles so only students actually attending class will know the question. Um, so you just simply by, again, making things only available in class that are not available in other parts of e-learning will encourage people to attend the, the live classes. Uh, and of course, with any uh, type of MCQ type question, include a lot of responses to decrease the likelihood of someone guessing the correct answer who wasn't there when it, the material was taught. Um, and again, like I said, res short response times work with, uh, you can set timers, which is nice uh, for those activities that lock out Again, encouraging all those things will encourage people to actually be in class. So lastly, I'm going to just say, whilst you, one hopes you'll never need to call yourself the e-police, um, as Gilly Salmon said in 2011 in a textbook um, where she looks at online assessment and moderating, um, you inevitably will find you need to make rules and enforce them. We can't have a totally open environment. 
Um, so you, you do need to have those rules and setting them at the start is pretty important. So some sort of code or practice of procedures and clear protocols for remoderation of exams is very important. Uh, and it's important to have those thought out in advance. Most, I'd say nearly all, uh, modern learning management systems have examination um, type um, tools that you can use now to help support that activity. Um, but you, you can also use uh, things like Turnitin or other external uh, types of uh, checking software and for where you have concerns over academic dishonesty. And it still unfortunately happens even in nursing occasionally. Um, so it's important that we're still aware of that and make rules that will obviously apply to all students so everybody is on a, um, a fair uh, platform uh, and we have some equity. Okay, so there's some sources for you. The things I discussed there, I understand the PDF will be available after. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and hand back over so we can have some questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Garrett. Um, we have had some questions submitted during your presentation that I'm happy to relay to you. And if there's any additional questions that um, people uh, that have attended today would like to ask, please feel free to contribute to submit them because we have a few minutes. Um, the first question is from Anita. Um, Anita says that although she agrees um, with you, Dr. Garrett, that the role of nurse educators should be one of a facilitator guide, that students sometimes enter university demanding to be given answers and the overall educational organization cave to these ways of sage on the stage approaches. Um, how, how, how would you respond to Anita's statement? Yeah, I think that's true, actually, Anita. I, I think you're right. There's very often this pressure to deliver. And of course, the, the worst thing is um, we're, we're very much governed by um, um, student assessments of teaching um, for promotion and tenure. And that does encourage you to do things that, that are very much student driven, which isn't a bad thing. But at the same time, we have to be a little more resistant to just delivering specific ways uh, of teaching that, that students expect like that, um, to push them. And as I said, to put, if, we, if we think about that curve I was talking about, to push your students out of their comfort zones, sometimes that's difficult. Um, but at the same time, it is sometimes necessary. So um, I, although there is this pressure in a lot of uh, ways to deliver didactic content, um, we do have to think of other ways as well that we can push students. So, so I think it's important to have a mix. Obviously, some didactic content is still going to be necessary, but obviously getting students to, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the classic ones is students asking for handouts before uh, a, um, a lecture, which sounds fine. It sounds great. You know, you give them a handout. So they've got all the slides there. Um, but the problem with that is, if you want to put something in that's going to throw them in the middle of the lecture, you don't want to give them that beforehand so they can go through and see, oh, he's going to ask a question that's, you know, uh, about something controversial or, or at this point, or ask me this question so I can look it up in advance. So you have to be quite careful that saying sometimes, you know, caving to exactly what the students want isn't necessarily the best thing for their learning. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Jean Dehan, and I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, what is the best practice for breaks during a given virtual teaching session? Um, is to have them, that, <laughs> that's for sure. But certainly I, I tend to divide, you know, an hour up into sort of um, three sections of 20 minutes at a, at a time. And um, I'll often give a break in each of those periods where we swap to a new activity, a very brief one, even a couple of minutes. Or if you've got, if you've got a long session, and I know some people are, you know, they're, they're, they're having Zoom sessions for a whole morning or half the afternoon or even a whole day, um, then you do need to build in some longer breaks into that, uh, obviously lunch. But certainly if you were in class for a morning, you're probably going to have a 15 or 20 minute break sometime in that morning. Same applies in Zoom, but you also, because we're on screen and it's much more intense staring at screens all the time, you need to build in some shorter non-screen based things, you know, just get people to write down, make a list of something. And so they're not looking at the screen, they're doing something else just for a couple of minutes during an activity or they're going away even and um, you know, having a, a very short bathroom break. Um, so making sure you've got them in there and schedule them uh, regularly more so than you probably do in a live classroom 
is pretty important. Well, today I really appreciated hearing your suggestion about uh, turning your camera off, especially if you're uh, doing the presentation. And, and that was something that I had never really considered before in my teaching. My phone never rings, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, that was one really um, wonderful suggestion. Another one was the poll.ev.com. Uh, to poll your students during the session just to keep them engaged. So I really appreciate that. Um, I, if there's any additional questions, now's a good time to ask them. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, be get familiar with a range of e-learning tools that are out there, not just what the university provides, because there's often um, stuff that is around that, you know, you can adapt and, and use. I mean, the classic simple one is things like YouTube videos, which most universities are using now, but you can you can find clips that illustrate things that you want. Um, yeah, you can vote on on um, on Zoom. So that's really kind of another nice way to keep students engaged. Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you again, Dr. Garrett. And I want to thank everyone who participated this Friday afternoon. Um, please note that the recording of this session will be made available on Cousin's YouTube channel and circulated to you in the coming days. Um, really, um, we want to share the link uh, far and wide to all of your network. So please go ahead and do that. And thanks again to everyone and Christine, Cousin, uh, certainly hopes that you will consider attending future sessions this fall, winter and spring for their Lunch and Learn series. Uh, so please visit the, their website, Cousin's website at casn.ca for their Lunch and Learn for further information.